Thank you. Uh, this is a brief uh, so the equation, and we got the characteristic equation from last time. Uh, the general topic for today is going to be oscillations, uh, which are extremely important in uh, the applications and in everyday life. But uh, the um, oscillations we know are associated with a complex root, so they correspond to complex roots. of that characteristic equation, uh, r squared plus uh, br plus k equals zero. Now I, I'd like to begin, uh, most of the lecture will be about discussing the relations between these numbers, these constants, and the various properties that the solutions, oscillatory solutions have. But before that, I'd like to begin by clearing up a a couple of questions almost everybody has at some point or other when they study the case of complex roots. Complex roots are the case which produce oscillations in the solutions. That's the relation, and that's why I'm talking about this for the first few minutes. Now, the, uh, <clears throat> so you get the, what is the problem? The complex roots, of course, there will be two roots and they occur, they're compl complex conjugates of each other, so they'll be of the form a plus or minus bi. Last time, I showed you, I took the root r equals a plus bi, which leads to the solution, the corresponding solution is, is a complex solution, which is e to the a t a plus i b t. And what we did was, the problem was to get real solutions out of that. We needed two real solutions. And the way I got them was by separating this into its real part and its imaginary part. And I proved a little theorem for you that said both of those give solutions. So the real part was e to the a t times cosine b t and the imaginary part was e to the a t sine b t. And those were the two solutions. So here was y1, and the point was those out of the complex solutions, we got real solutions. We have to have real solutions because we live in the real world. The equation is real. Its coefficients are real. They represent real quantities. Uh, that's the way the solutions, therefore, have to be. Uh, so these, the point is, these are now real solutions. These two guys, y1 and y2. Now, the first question almost everybody has, and I was pleased to see that at the end of the lecture, a few people came up and asked me, uh, yeah, well, you took a plus bi, but there was another root, a minus bi. You didn't use that one. That would give two more solutions, right? Of course, they didn't say that. They were too smart. They just said, what about that other root? Well, what about it? Uh, the reason I don't have to talk about the other root is because although it does give two solutions, it doesn't give two new ones. Uh, maybe I could indicate that most clearly here, uh, even though you won't be able to take notes, by just using colored chalk. Suppose instead of a plus bi, I would used a minus bi. What would have changed? Well, this would now become minus here. Would this change? No because e to the minus i b t is the cosine of minus b, but that's the same as the cosine of b. How about here? This would have become the sine of minus b t, but that's simply the negative of the sine of b t. So the only answer change would have been to put a minus sign there. Now, I don't care if I get y2 or negative y2, because what am I going to do with it? When I get it, I'm going to write y, the general solution, as c1y1 plus c2y2. 
So if I get negative y2, that just changes that arbitrary constant from c2 to minus c2, which is just as arbitrary a constant. So in other words, there's no p reason to use the other root because it doesn't give anything new. Now, there the story could stop, uh, and I would like it to stop, frankly, uh, but I don't dare because uh, there's a second question. Uh, and I'm visiting recitations, not this semester, but in previous semesters in 1803. So many recitations do this, I have to partly inoculate you against it and partly tell you that some of the engineering courses do do it, and therefore you probably should learn it also. So there's another way of proceeding, which is what you might have thought. Hey, look, uh, we got two complex roots. That gives us two solutions, which are different. They're not, neither one is a constant multiple of the other. Why not? So the other approach is use as the general solution y equals, now I'm going to put a capital C here. Uh, you'll see y in just a second. Times e to the a plus bi times t. And then I'll use the other solution. C2 times e to the a minus b i t. These are two independent solutions, and uh, therefore can't I get the general solution in that form? Now, in a sense you can. The whole problem is the following, of course, that I'm only interested in real solutions. This is a complex function. This is another complex function. It's got an i in it, in other words, when I write it out as u plus iv. If I expect to be able to get a real solution out of that, that means I have to make allow these coefficients to be complex numbers and not real numbers. So in other words, what I'm saying is that an expression like this, where the a plus bi and a minus bi are the roots of that, are complex roots of that characteristic equation, is formally a very general complex solution to the equation. And it, therefore, the problem becomes how from this expression do I get the real solutions? So the problem is I accept these as the complex solutions. My problem is to find among all these guys where C1 and C2 are allowed to be complex, the problem is which of the green solutions are real. Now, there are many ways of getting the answer. There's a super hack way. The super hack way is to say, well, this one is C1 plus ID1. This is C2 plus ID2, and I'll write all this out in terms of what it is, you know, cosine plus sine, or cosine plus I sine, and don't forget the e to the at. And I'll write it all out, and it'll take an entire board, and then I'll just see what the condition is. I'll write its real part, and it's an imaginary part, and then I'll say the imaginary part has got to be zero, and that, then I'll see what it's like. That works fine. It just takes too much space. And also, it doesn't teach you a few things that I think you should know. So I'm going to give another. So, the, so let's say we can answer this two ways by hack. In other words, multiply everything out. Multiply all out. Make the imaginary part equal 0. Now, here's a better way, in my opinion. Uh, what I'm trying to do is, this is some complex function, u plus iv. How do I know when a complex function is real? I want this to be real. Well, the hack method corresponds to saying v must be equal to 0. It's real if v is 0. So expand it out and see when v is 0. Uh, there's a slightly more subtle method, which is, to change i to minus i, and what? And see if it stays the same. And see if it stays the same. 
Because if I change i to minus i, and it turns out the expression doesn't change, then it must have been real. See that? V must have been 0 if this expression doesn't change when I change i to minus i. Well, sure, but well, you'll see it work. All right, now that's what I'm going to apply to this. If I want this to be real, I phrase the question, in my, I rephrase the question for the green equation, the green solution as uh, change. So I'm going to change i to minus i in the green thing. And that's going to give me what conditions, and, and that will give conditions on the c's. Well, let's do it. In fact, it's easier done than talked about. Let's change, take the green solution and change. So I don't want to re, well, I'd better recopy it. C1. So these are complex numbers. That's why I wrote them as capital letters, because little letters you t tend to interpret as real numbers. Uh, so C1, e to the a plus b i t, I'll recopy it quickly, plus C2, e to the a minus b i t. OK, we're going to change i to negative i. Now, here's a complex number. What happens to it when you change i to negative i? You change it into its class? What do we change it into? Its complex conjugate, right? Can I? And the notation for complex conjugate is you put a bar over it. So in other words, when I do that, the c1 changes to c1 bar, complex conjugate the complex conjugate of C1. What happens to this guy? This guy changes to E, uh, sorry. This guy changes to E to the A minus B I T. This changes to the complex conjugate of C2, now times E to the A plus B I T. Well, I want these two to be the same. I want the two expressions the same. Why do I want them the same? Because if they stay, if, if, no ch if there's no change, that will mean that it's real. Now, when is that going to happen? That happens if, well, here is this, that, if C2 should be equal to C1 bar. That's only one condition. There's another condition. C2 bar should equal C1. So I get two conditions, but there's really only one condition there, because if this is true, that's true too. I simply put bars over both things, and you know, two bars cancel each other out. If you take the complex conjugate and do it again, you get back where you started with. Change i to minus i, and then i to minus i again. The Well, <laughs> never mind. Anyway, these are the same. These, this equation doesn't say anything that the first one didn't say already. So this one is redundant. And our conclusion is, the conclusion is that the real solution to the equation are in their entirety. I now know, don't need both C2 and C1. One of them will do. And since I'm going to write it out as a complex number, I'll write it out in terms of its coefficient. So it's C1, well, let's just simply write it, C plus I times D. That's the coefficient. That's what I called C1 before. And that's times E to the A plus B I T. There's no reason why I put B I here and I D there, in case you're wondering. <laughs> Sheer caprice. Uh, and what's the other term? Now the other term is completely determined. Its coefficients must be C minus ID times E to the A minus B I T. In other words, this thing is perfectly general. Any complex number times that first root you used, exponentiated. And the second term can be described as the complex conjugate of the first. The coefficient is the complex conjugate, and this part is the complex conjugate of that. 
Now, it's in this form, in this form, some, many engineers write the solution this way, and physicists too, so scientists and engineers will include. Write the solution this way. Write the real solutions this way in that complex form, well, why do they do something so perverse? You'll have to ask them, but in fact, when we study Fourier series, we'll probably have to do something, have to do that at one point. Um, if you work a lot with complex numbers, it turns out to be, in some ways, a more convenient representation than the one I've given you in terms of sines and cosines. Well, from this, how would I get, suppose I insisted, well, I, if, if someone gave it to me in that form, I don't see how I would convert it back into sines and cosines. And I'd like to show you how to do that efficiently, too, because, again, it's one of the fundamental techniques that I think you should know. And I didn't get a chance to say it when we studied complex numbers that first lecture. It's in the notes, but that doesn't prove anything, since I don't think I made you use it in, a, in, a, in, a, um, uh, in an example. So the problem is now, by way of finishing this up, to how do you to change this to the old form? I mean the form involving sines and cosines. Now again, there are two ways of doing it. The hack way is you write it all out. Well, the e to the at, a to the a plus b i t turns into e to the at times sine, cosine this plus i sine that. And the other term does too. And then you got stuff out front. And it, you know the whole thing stretches over two boards. But you group all the terms together. You finally get it. By the way, when you do it, you'll find that the imaginary part disappears completely. It has to, because that's the way that we chose the coefficients. Uh, so there's the hack method. Write it all out. Blah, 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 blah. And nicer. Nicer and teach you something you're supposed to know. Write it this way. First of all, you notice that both terms have an e to the at factor. Let's get rid of that right away. I'm pulling it out front because that's automatically real and therefore isn't going to affect the rest of the answer at all. So let's pull out that. And what's left? Well, what's left, you see, involves just the two parameters, C and D. So I'm going to have a C term, and I'm going to have a D term. What's the, what multiplies the un arbitrary constant C? Answer, after I've removed D to the AT, what multiplies it is E to the BIT plus e to the e to the b i t uh, let's write it i b t and the other term is plus e to the negative i b t you see how i got that pulled it out and how about the d what goes with d d goes with well first of all there's an i in front that i better not forget And then the rest of it is I, so it's ID times. It's E to the BIT, E to the IBT, minus now E to the minus IBT. So that's the way the solution looks. It doesn't look a lot better, but now you must use the magic formulas, which I want you to know as well as you know Euler's formula, even better than you know Euler's formula. OK? And there are consequences of Euler's formula. There are Euler's formula read backwards. Euler's formula says, you got a complex exponential. Here is how to write it in terms of sines and cosines. The backwards thing says, you got a sine or a cosine. Here's the way to write it in terms of complex exponentials. And remember, the way to do it is cosine a is equal to e to the uh, iat 
IA plus E to the negative IA divided by 2. And sine of A is almost the same thing except you use a minus sign. And what everybody forgets, you have to divide by I. So this is the backward version of Euler's formula. They're equivalent, the two of them taken together are equivalent to Euler's formula. If, you, if I took cosine A, multiplied this through by I, and added them up, on the right-hand side, I'd get exactly E to the IA. I'd get Euler's formula, in other words. All right, so what does this come out to be, finally? This is this, this particular sum of exponentials you should always recognize as real. You know it's real because when I change i to minus i, the two terms switch, and therefore it's real. It, the expression doesn't change. What is it? This part is twice the cosine of bt. What's this part? This part is 2i to i times the sine of bt. And so what does the whole thing come out to be? It is e to the at times 2c cosine bt plus i times, uh, did I uh, lose a possibly a, no, it's OK, uh, minus i times i is minus, so minus 2d times the sine of bt. Shall I write that out? So I'll, in other words, it's e to the at times 2c cosine bt minus 2d times the sine of bt, which is, since 2c and negative 2d are just arbitrary constants, just as arbitrary the constants as c and d themselves are, this is our old form of writing the solution, real solution. So here's the way using sines and cosines, and here's there's the way that uses complex numbers and complex functions throughout. Notice, they both have two arbitrary constants in them, C and D. Arbit two arbitrary constants that you expect, but that has two arbitrary constants in it too, just the real and imaginary parts of that complex coefficient C plus ID. Well, that took half the period and it was a long, I don't consider it a digression because learning those ways of dealing with complex numbers and complex functions is, one, is a fairly important goal of this course, actually. But let's get back now to studying what the oscillations actually look like. Uh, OK, um, well, I'd like to save a little time, but I'll very quickly, you don't have to reproduce this sketch. I just want you to, re you know, I, I remember very well from Friday to Monday, but I can't expect you do uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, <laughs> mainly, I have to think about this stuff all weekend, uh, and you, I, God forbid. Uh, So here's the picture, and I won't any more explain what's in it, but except there's the mass, here is the spring constant, the spring with its constant here, here is the dash pot with its constant. The equation is from Newton's law, mx double, so this will be x, and here's, let's say, is equilibrium point is over here. It looks like mx double prime, we derived this last time, plus cx prime plus kx equals zero. And now if I put that in standard form, it's going to look like x double prime plus c over m x prime plus k over m times x equals 0. And finally, the standard form in which your book writes it, which is good, uh, that it's a standard form in general that is, is uh, used in the science and engineering courses. Uh, one writes... Um, One writes this as uh, 
Uh, just to be perverse, I'm going to change x back to y, OK? Uh, so I, mostly just to be eclectic, to get you used to every conceivable notation. So I'm going to write this as change x to y. So that's going to be going y double prime. And now this is given a new name, p, except to get rid of lots of twos, which would uh, really screw up the formulas, make it 2p. You'll see y in a minute. So there's 2p times a y prime. And this thing we're going to call omega naught squared. Now, that's OK. It's a positive number. Any positive number is the square of some other positive number. You know, take its square root. You'll see why to make the, it just makes the formulas much pretty to call it that. And it makes it also a lot of things much easier to remember. So all I'm doing is changing the names of the constants in that way uh, in order to get better formulas, easier to remember formulas at the end. OK, now we're interested in the case where there's oscillations. In other words, I only care about the case in which this has complex roots. Because if it has just real roots, that's the overdamped case. I don't get any oscillations. It's a, by far, oscillations is by far the more important of the cases, two cases. I mean, just because, I don't know, I, I could go on for five minutes listing things that oscillate. Uh, ah. Oscillations, you know, like this. So they could oscillate by going to sleep and waking up and going to sleep and waking up. They could oscillate. Uh, OK, so that means we're going to get complex roots. Uh, the characteristic equation is going to be r squared plus 2p. So p is a constant now, right? Uh, often p I use in this position to indicate a function of t. But here p is a constant. So r squared plus 2p times r plus omega naught squared is equal to 0. Now what are its roots? Well, you see right away the first advantage in putting in the 2 there. When I use the quadratic formula, it's negative 2p over 2. Remember that 2 in the denominator. So that's simply negative p. And how about the rest? Plus or minus the square root of, now do it in your head, b squared, 4p squared minus 4 omega naught squared. So there's a 4 in both of those terms. When I pull it outside, it becomes a 2. And then the 2 in the denominator is lurking, waiting to annihilate it. So that 2 disappears entirely. And what we're left with is simply p squared minus omega naught squared. Now, whenever people write quadratic equations and arbitrarily put a 2 in there, it's because they weren't going to want to solve the quadratic equation using the quadratic formula. And they don't want it, all those 2s and 4s to be cluttering up the formula. That's what we're doing here. OK, now, the first case is where p is equal to 0. This is going to explain immediately why I wrote that omega naught squared. That you probably already know from physics. If p is equal to 0, the mass isn't 0. Otherwise, nothing would good would be happening here. Uh, it must be that the damping is 0. So p is equal to 0 corresponds to undamped. There is no dash pot. The oscillations are undamped. Uh, and the equation then becomes the solutions then are, well, the equation becomes the equation of simple harmonic motion, which I think you already are used to writing in this form. And the reason you're writing in this form, because you know when you do that, this becomes the circular frequency of the oscillations. The solutions are pure oscillations, and omega naught is their circular frequency. So right away from the equation itself, if you write it in this form, you can read off what the frequency of the solutions is going to be, the circular frequency of the solutions. Now, the solutions themselves, of course, look like the general solutions look like uh, y equal. In this particular case, there is no, the p part is 0. This is 0. It's simply. So in this case, r is equal to uh, omega naught i times omega naught. 
plus or minus, but as before, we don't bother with a minus sign since one of those roots is good enough. And then the solutions are simply uh, uh, C1 cosine omega naught t plus C2 sine omega naught t. That's if you write it out in the sign. And if you write it using the trigonometric identity, then the other way of writing it is that <clears throat> A times the cosine of omega naught t. But now you'll have to put in a phase lag. So you have those two forms of writing it. And I assume you remember the little triangle, which converts one into the other. OK, so this justifies calling this omega naught squared rather than k over m. Uh, and now the question is, what does the damp case look like? That's more requires a somewhat closer analysis, and it requires a certain amount of thinking. <clears throat> uh, so let's begin with an epsilon bit of thinking. Uh, so here is my question. So in the undamp case, how do I get, I want to be sure that I'm getting oscillations. When do I get oscillations if, well, we get oscillations if those roots are really complex and not masquerading. Now, when are the roots going to be really complex? This has to be, the inside has to be negative. P squared minus omega squared must be ne negative. P naught, P squared minus omega naught squared must be less than 0 so that we're taking the square root of a negative number and we're getting real complex roots, really complex roots. In other words, now this says, remember, these numbers are all positive, uh, p and omega naught are positive. So the condition is that p is, should be less than omega naught. In other words, the damping should be less than the frequency, the circular frequency. Uh, except that p is not the damping. It's half the damping or twice. It's half the, it's half the damping, and it's not really the damping either because it involved the M2. You better just call it P. Uh, naturally, I could write the condition out in terms of C, M, and K. Uh, so your book does that, but I'm not going to. Gives it in terms, gives this, gives it in terms of C, M, and K, which somebody might want to know. But you know, we don't have to do everything. OK, so let's assume that this is true. Uh, then how, what does the solution look like? Well, we already experimented with that last time. I'm going to first draw it. Uh, remember, uh, there was some guiding thing, which was an exponential. And then down here, we wrote the negative. So this was an, this was an exponential. In fact, it was the exponential e to the negative p uh, t. Uh, and in between that, the curve tried to do its thing. So the solution then looks sort of like this. It oscillated, but it had to use th that exponential function as its guidelines, as its amplitude, in other words. Now, this is a really, truly terrible picture. It's so terrible, it's unusable. Uh, OK, this, never, this picture never happened. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, this is not my forte, along with a lot of other things. Uh, all right, let's try better. Here's our better picture. OK, there's the exponential. At this point, I'm supposed to have a lecture demonstration. You know, uh, uh, it's supposed to go up on the thing so you can all see it. But then you wouldn't be able to copy it. So it's at least we're on even terms now. OK, how does the actual curve look? Uh, well, I'm just trying to be fair, that's all. Uh, OK, after a while, the point is, it's, let's try to, so just so we have something to aim at, let's say. OK, here we're going to go. We're going to get down through there, and then uh, this is good. This is our better curve. OK. 
So I am a solution. A particular solution satisfying this initial condition. I started here, and that was my initial velocity. The slope of that thing gave me the initial velocity. Now, the interesting question is, the first, in some ways, the most interesting question, though there'll be others, too, is, what is this spacing? Well, that's a period. And now, the period would be, it's, it's half a period. I, I clearly ought to think of this as the whole period. So let's call that, uh, I'm going to call this pi over, so this spacing here, from there to there. I'll call that pi divided by omega 1, because this, from here to here, should be, I hope, twice, twice that, 2 pi over omega 1. Now, my question is, so this, for a solution, uh, it's, in fact, is going to cross the axis regularly in that way. My question is, how does this period, so this is going to be its half period. I'll put period in quotation marks because this isn't really a periodic function because it's decreasing all the time in amplitude, but it's trying to be periodic. At least it's doing something periodically. It's crossing the axis periodically. So this is the half period. 2 pi over omega 1 would be its full period. What I want to know is, how does that half period, or how does, uh, how does omega 1 is called its uh, pseudo frequency. This should really be called its pseudo period. Everything's pseudo, everything's fake here. You know, like the amoeba has its fake foot and stuff like that. Okay, uh, so this is its pseudo period, pseudo frequency. Pseudo circular frequency, but that's hopeless. I guess it should be circular pseudo frequency or pseudo, I don't know how you say that. I don't think pseudo is a word all by itself, uh, not even in 1803. Circular. Okay, here's my question. If the damping goes up, This is the damping term. If the damping goes up, what happens to the pseudo frequency? The frequency is how often the curve cross, you know, how this is high frequency and this is low frequency. Okay? <laughs> so my question is which way does the frequency go? If the damping goes up, does the frequency go up or down? Down. I mean, I'm just asking you to answer intuitively on the basis of your intuition about how this thing explains, uh, how this thing goes, and, and um, and well, now let's get the formula. What, in fact, is omega 1? What is omega 1? The answer is, when I solve the equation, so r is now, so in other words, if omega 1 is, if, if, sorry, if I have p, if p is no longer 0, as it was in the undamped case, what is the root now? OK, well, the root is minus p plus or minus the square root of p squared. Now I'm going to write it this way, minus, to indicate that it's really a negative number, omega squared minus p squared. Now, I'm going to call this, because you see when I change this to sines and cosines, the square root of this number is what's going to become that new frequency. I'm going to call that minus p plus or minus the square root of minus omega 1 squared. That's going to be the new frequency. 
And therefore, the root is going to change so that it's the corresponding solution then is going to look how? Well, it's going to be e to the negative pt times, let's write it out first in terms of sines and cosines, times the cosine of, well, the square root of omega 1 squared is omega 1. But there's an i out front because of the negative, the negative sign in front of that. So it's going to be the cosine of omega 1t plus c2 times the sine of omega 1t. Or if you prefer to write it out in the other form, it's e to the minus pt times some amplitude, which depends on c1 and c2, times the cosine of omega 1t minus the phase lag. Now when I do that, you see omega 1 is this pseudo frequency. In other words, this number omega 1 is the same one as I've identified here. And why is that? Well, because what are two successive times? Suppose it crosses, suppose the solution crosses the x-axis for the first, the y, uh, sorry, y, the t-axis. For the first time at the point t1, what's the next time uh, it crosses at t2? Uh, let's, let's jump to the two times it crosses. So this is a, I want this to be a whole period, not a half period. What's t2? Well, I say that t2 is nothing but 2 pi divided by omega 1. And you can see that because when I plug in, if it's 0, at, if, if I have a point where it's 0, at, so omega 1 t minus phi, when will it be 0 for the first time? Well, that will be when the cosine has to be 0, so it'll be some multiple of, uh, it'll be, say, pi over 2. Then the next time this happens will be, if that happens at t1, then the next time it happens will be at t1 plus 2 pi divided by omega 1. That will also be pi over, uh, that will be pi over 2 plus, how much? Plus 2, 2 pi, which is the next time the cosine gets around and is doing its thing, becoming uh, 0 on, as it goes down, not as it's coming up again. In other words, this is what you should add to the first time to get this second time that the cosine becomes zero coming in, that, coming in the direction from top to the bottom. So this is, in fact, the frequency with which it's crossing the axis. Now, notice, gee, I'm running out of boards. What a disaster. In that expression, take a look at it. I want to know what depends on what. So, p. In that, we got constants. We got p, we got phi, we got a. What else we got? Omega 1. What do these things depend upon? You got to keep it firmly in mind. This depends only on the ODE. It's basically the damping. It depends on C and M. It's essentially, it's like, it's C over 2M, actually. How about phi? Well, phi, what else depends only on the ODE? Omega 1 depends only on the ODE. Uh, what's the formula for omega 1? Omega 1 squared, where do we have it? Omega 1 squared, I didn't, I never wrote the formula for you. Uh, so we have omega naught squared minus p squared equals omega 1 squared. What's the relation between them? That's the Pythagorean theorem. If this is omega naught, then this omega 1, this is p. They make a little right triangle, in other words. Uh, 
the omega-1 depends on the spring. So it's equal to, well, it's equal to that thing. So it depends on the damping, and it depends upon the damping, and it depends on the spring, the spring constant. How about the phi and the A? What do they depend on? They depend upon the initial conditions. So this mess of constants, they have different functions. They're, it's, what's making this complicated is that there are four parameters. Our answer has four parameters, needs four parameters to describe it. This tells you how fast it's coming down. This tells you the phase lag. This tells you this, this amplitude modifies the e to the minus. It tells you whether the exponential curve starts going like that or goes like this. And finally, the omega-1 is this pseudo-frequency, which tells you how it's bobbing up and down.